Take your Bibles this morning, if you would, and turn with me to an Old Testament book, the book of 2 Kings. 2 Kings and chapter number 20. I'm going to give you a moment to find that. If you need a Bible, we certainly would love to share a Bible with you and give you a Bible. There may be one there in the pew for you to have. If you'd like to have one, you be sure to take that with you. I failed to mention that Wednesday nights are also a very special time in our church. I don't know about you, but I really, really enjoy Wednesday nights. Amen. 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 We're learning right now. We're going through the book of Acts. We're talking about the legacy of Christ as it's seen through his church, the local church. We just finished a sub-series in Acts 2 called The Seven Things That Did Not Happen on the Day of Pentecost. Seven Things That Did Not Happen. And this uh, coming Wednesday night, we'll be continuing on in Acts chapter number 2, and we're going to be talking about what every church was meant to be and found in Acts 2, 41 through 47. So I hope you'll be here for that on Wednesday night. It's a great way to study the Word of God with others, and uh, we, we look forward to seeing you then. There are about a half dozen subjects or topics found in the Word of God that I believe ought to be preached more often than other subjects in the Bible. I um, Don't get me wrong, I believe that as a preacher we are commanded to preach the whole counsel of God and therefore I don't want to leave anything out and I will do my best to preach to you everything there is to be preached out of the Word of God. But I still stand by this statement that there are about five or six topics or subjects in the Word of God that ought to be hammered more, preached more, and taught more than than the others. And, And one of those special topics is the subject of prayer. Prayer. I don't know about you, again, uh, I'm still learning how to pray. I've been in the ministry a long time. I've been saved over 45 years, and I've prayed a lot of prayers, but I'm still learning how to pray. And I bet you are too. Not once did the disciples ever ask Jesus, Lord, teach us to preach. They never asked the Lord, Lord, teach us to teach. They never said, Lord, teach us how to perform miracles. But one time they came to him and they did ask, Lord, teach us to pray. There was something about the prayer life of the Lord Jesus Christ that was so amazing, so extraordinary, that they themselves wanted a piece of that. They wanted to learn what it was to have such a prayer life. Can I tell you something this morning, and this is where we head into the message today. You never really know what prayer is all about until you hit crises moments in your life. You don't really know what it's about. You think you do. You may even know the model prayer, we call it, that the Lord gave His disciples to teach them how to pray. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forget, forgive those who are indebted to us and so forth and so on. But we really don't know how important it is, how much we need it, how much we need to know how to do it until we meet those moments in life when we are actually in a do or die situation. Amen? This morning I want you to meet a character in the Word of God that came to one of those moments in his life and he needed God to come in and help. 
2 Kings chapter 20, if you have it, let's stand together as we honor the reading of God's Word. 2 Kings chapter 20, follow with me as I read this morning, verse number 1. In those days was Hezekiah, note the name, Hezekiah, sick unto death. And the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Then he, that's Hezekiah, turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord, saying, I beseech thee. The word beseech means beg. I beg thee, O Lord. Remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. And it came to pass, before Isaiah was gone out into the middle court, <clears throat> that the word of the Lord came to him saying, Turn again and tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer. I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee. On the third day thou shalt go up unto the house of the Lord. Now notice that phrase back up in verse number 2. And I want to preach to you a little while on the subject Praying with your face to the wall. Praying with your face to the wall. Now, Lord, I need your help as always this morning. I ask that you might help me to be a, a good preacher, a good communicator. Help me to be able, Lord, to rightly divide the word of truth and to be able today to communicate this very awesome, very special and very needy message. All of us need this this morning. If we don't need it at this very moment, we're going to need it. And we're going to need to know what it means to pray with our face to the wall. And God, I pray that you'll help me to deliver it. If there's someone today that doesn't know Christ as their Savior, that today might be the day of their salvation. And I ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You might be seated this morning. And so I ask you this question today, have you ever been in a situation where you felt like you were backed up to a wall? Put your thinking caps on for me, please. Have you ever been backed up to a wall? How many times have I heard someone say to me or confess to me in a, in a, in a, in a counseling session, they would say, Pastor, uh, I've got this problem, I've got this, this issue, I'm, I, I'm in the middle of this conflict, and preacher, to be honest with you, I just feel like my back is up against the wall. What does that mean? Well, it means that you're facing a situation that, as I said a moment ago, is really a do or die situation. You're up against that wall. You're not going to move that wall by yourself. This is a crisis moment. It's an extraordinary moment. You have nowhere to turn. You have no one to go to for help. You have no friend who can get you out of this situation. You have no relative that can buy you or re rectify this problem. Your back is against the wall. And the truth of the matter is this. You look at your resources and there's just not enough resources. You look at your strength and there just ain't enough strength. You look at your arguments. Maybe you feel like you can argue a way around it. Just no way to do that. You are at your wit's end. This thing has stopped you. It stopped you dead in your tracks. It, it stopped you from going forward. You're never going to take another step until this wall is somehow moved. You feel hopeless. You feel... Helpless, you may feel heartless. You feel like this thing has affected you, not just in your mind, but your spirit. 
your soul. You're not going to get around that wall. You're not going to get over that wall. You're certainly not going to go through that wall. What's left to do? Your options are now limited. What do you do? I mean, and you know, now you're thinking with me, maybe you're in that situation right now. Maybe you're facing that right now. It may not be something others see. It could be a private thing, a sickness, a marital problem, a personal issue, a mental issue. But something has you stopped. You are up against the wall. And it looks like if nothing changes, that that wall that you're backed up against is going to become your grave marker. They're going to engrave your name on it. Put your birth date and your death date, and that'll be the wall that ends it all, if nothing changes. Maybe the doctor's diagnosis has come back. Maybe the program, or rather the prognosis, <clears throat> is, uh, is, is, is uh, fatal. Your back's against the wall. The loan company, they've been calling. You're late on your bills. Your mortgage is late. Your insurance is late. Repossession is imminent. You got your back up against the wall. The pink slips at the job are being handed out. You know yours is coming. God, what will I do without a job? My back is up against the wall. My child is sick and dying and I don't know where to go and there's no doctors to help and the chemo's not helping and the radiation's not helping and this is not helping and, and, and I don't know what's left to do and my back is up against the wall. I think about folks in this room this morning. I look out across this crowd and I see faces of people and I won't call their names and I won't embarrass them but their, their back's up against the wall. They have loved ones who's, who's, who needs attention and help and, and they're, 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 they're up against the wall. There, there are marriages in this room that may be up against the wall. You're having trouble and, 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 and you're there. This thing may kick, uh, may have you kick your bucket, you know, in essence. This thing may kill you. Uh, maybe you're facing mental. Listen, you don't understand. Maybe you do, but we're living in a day with great mental stress all around us. People are committing suicide by numbers unlike any before. Do you understand this? Don't be an ostrich. Don't put your head in the sand this morning. People are stressed out. People are up against the wall. Problems abound on every side. And it looks like this thing is going to kill you. That's where Hezekiah was. Hezekiah, what a great king. They call him the faithful king. Had a sorry daddy. His daddy's name was Ahaz. Ahaz was a horrible king. In fact, during Ahaz's reign in Judah, he closed the temple, shut the doors, locked it up. Made it so that no one could go into the temple and worship. He even built groves and trees and places where people could go and secretly worship God with prostitutes. He was an evil man. He even took his own children. Of course, Hezekiah wasn't one of them, but others of his brothers and sisters, the king Ahaz would take and burn it on the altar of Molech, the false god who was built with arms out like this so that they could lay their babies, build a fire underneath and watch their babies burn. This was Ahaz. Horrible, horrible king. When Hezekiah was 25, he became king. He would reign for 29 years and would be what, what I just said, the faithful king. He was a king that would do that which was right in the sight of God. He would be of the same heart and of the same mind as David was, a man after God's own heart. And God blessed him. He was faithful. He reopened the church doors, told people to come back in worship. He, he took out all the groves. He tore down the altars and the idols. He reinstituted uh, Sunday school and church and, and people came and there was a revival in the land. Hezekiah was a good man. 
He was a good king and he was doing the right thing. And yet, sickness came. You ever felt like sometimes God isn't quite fair? Well, I don't understand, God. I, I, I'm serving you and I'm doing what you tell me to do and, and, and I'm being faithful. And, and God, now the doctors tell me this and that and, 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 and Lord, I'm up against a wall. What, what's going on here? And, 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 and Isaiah, his friend, the prophet Isaiah, comes to him. Well, think about it. Isaiah is sick. Evidently, he has some kind of a, a boil or something that came up on him, and, and it began to infect his blood. And, 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 and the doctors of that day knew enough to know that this thing was just going to kill him. It was getting worse and worse. And sure enough, here comes Isaiah marching into the king's bedroom. What's the message from God, old prophet? Set your house in order, Hezekiah. Thou shalt die. And not live. He's only about 30 years old. About 34 I think it was. He's not an old man. He's tried to eat from 25 for 9 years of, 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 of being king. He's done the right thing. It just doesn't make sense does it? It doesn't make sense that somebody who's actually getting something done for God. Would be taken away. Don't make sense. Why, God? Why? But Hezekiah, thus saith God Almighty, set your house in order. You're going to die and not live. Isaiah turns and walks away. As Isaiah leaves the room, Hezekiah turns his face to the wall. You know, can I tell you something? Even the most public of figures have personal problems. Amen. You ever looked at somebody and thought, man, that guy's got it going on. Celebrity, money, fame, health. Look at that guy go, man, he is something else. Famous, everybody knows him, you know. You think, oh, Johnny's got it made, but there's an amber. <laughs> Some of you get that. What? I don't understand. You look, oh, I wish I was that guy. Uh, he's got problems too. Listen, not, not to be mean, honestly, just honest, just being honest, honest, honest with you this morning. Who would have ever suspected that Robin Williams would have taken his own life? He made people happy. He made people laugh. As far as I know, he was a good husband and a good father, and, 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 all, and, and yet he was faced with a crisis moment in his life, and he found out that what he had would be terminal, and what would he do? And he was up against a wall, and he did what he did. Well, who'd ever thought things like that? People, no matter how famous they may be, how much money, listen, people with money have problems. Have you ever thought to yourself, boy, if I could just win that Powerball, if I could just get a few million dollars in the bank, you know? How, how, how much that would change my life, I would finally be happy. You know? All that money. And I'll guarantee you some of those unhappiest stories you'll ever read are people who got those big Powerballs and didn't know what to do with it. Destroyed their life. Didn't know where to hide it, where to put it, how to invest it. Didn't know it all. By the way, if you ever win one of those big things, I can tell you how to invest it. Yeah. <laughs> right here. Amen. <clears throat> People may be famous, may be rich, may have all the world at the tip of their fingers, and yet they have problems. No one is immune. There hath no temptation, no testing, no trial taken you, but such as is common to man. Everybody has problems. Hezekiah 
faces that wall in a very personal and private moment. And he says these words in verse 3. I beg thee, God, I beseech thee, O Lord. Remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in thy sight. There was nothing wrong with him praying that prayer. Nothing wrong at all. And there's nothing wrong for you if you're in a crisis moment. If you have done the right thing, God doesn't need to be reminded, but it will increase your faith if you'll remind yourself. Remind yourself when you get to those moments. If I die, I die. If I perish, I perish, but I'll perish right. I'll perish right. I've done the right thing. And Lord, you know I've done the right thing. I've tried to raise my kids right. And I've tried to make sure that people had a place to worship. And I've tried, Lord, to, to promote God and His Word. I've tried to live right in this old wicked world. And, he, and, he, and He's saying these things. And, and I love that little phrase. Nothing in the Bible is there by coincidence. He says there, uh, verse 3, And Hezekiah wept sore. Now, have you ever wept sore? <laughs> what does that mean? To weep sore. You got a scratch, an itch, you go to scratching it and it itches some more and you scratch it some more and it itches some more and you scratch it some more and all of a sudden you've just made a big old sore on your arm. He went to prayer and he just kept on praying and kept on praying and he just wept and kept on crying until his eyes were bugged out and there's water streaming down his cheeks and he can't see for all the tears in his eyes. He wept exceedingly. He, he wept sore. And he did it pretty quick because by the time Isaiah gets to the middle court, he's not even out of the palace yet. He's in the middle court and it's like God just stops him all of a sudden. And God says, turn around. Okay? Go back and tell Hezekiah I've heard his prayer. And go back and tell him that I'm going to add to his years 15 more. 15 more years. Now, we know the rest of the story. Those of you who know the Bible know that he didn't quite meet up to what it was. He could have during those years. There were some problems, obviously. But just the fact that God heard his prayer and answered, what is it that got God's attention? Don't you want to know that? I do. When I get to moments like that in my life and I wonder what's going to... Listen, I went to the doctor this week. Now I know this is not a big deal and it ain't going to be a big deal. But three years ago, three years ago I got two stents in my, I think call it LAD, the descending artery on the left side. And it's the, it's the widow maker. And I uh, had two stents put in there, and I've been feeling pretty good. And then uh, went back for another stress test. Whew, that was tough. And the doctor didn't like what he saw. saw and he said, there's some abnormalities. I said, well, that's just me, preacher, I, or doctor. I'm abnormal. He said, no, this is something got something going on here. Going to have to have another heart cath. And so they're going to schedule me one. They think it might be the right coronary. Okay. So... I went home, put my face to the wall. Now, Lord, I'd like to live. Amen. I got a reason to live. First time in my life, I got a church that I think loves me. I, I, got, I got grandchildren that love me, a wife that loves me. I, got, I told Micah, uh, came and saw me for a night, him and Josh, and I told Micah, we were talking, I said, man, I said, you pray for Papa. I want to hang around long enough to see you get married. And he said, Papa, you really going to be old when that happens. <laughs> really be old. Those moments come and you wonder, well, what's going on here, Lord? I, I got things to do. I, I, I want to I wanna live. I want to live. I, I, more, give, me a fifth, give me 15 more years. and I'd appreciate it, Lord. We'll see what God does on that one. But I'm telling you, all of us have those moments. All of us are going to come to those moments. Hezekiah was a good man with a big problem. And he went and he prayed. He faced that wall. 
It was a crisis moment. I remember years ago, many years ago, my son uh, was out delivering papers. It's like 3.30 in the morning. And, and my son's not the best of drivers. He's kind of like, he just ain't a good driver. And he's had several accidents that probably should have killed him. I just, he knows it, I know it, God knows it, everybody knows it. Uh, so, so he had had an accident, we were dealing with that. His house burned down in Benton. House burned down. But he's out there delivering papers. 3.30 in the morning, my phone rings, I flip it open and, and, and look at it, and it's my, my daughter-in-law's uh, name showed up. Listen, when the phone rings at 30, 3.30, 3.30 in the morning, that ain't good. Nothing good comes out of that, right? Nothing good. I said, what's going on? What's going on? She said, Papa, Josh has had an accident. The hospital just called me. They won't tell me what's going on. But a driver T-boned him. He was drunk. T-boned him right on the driver's side. He, it knocked him unconscious. All they can tell me is that he's in the ER and, 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 and I need to get there quick. I had prayer with her. I hung the phone up. I slid down beside the bed. And I started praying. My prayer went something like this. God, I don't want to lose my son. I don't even know if he's alive right now. I don't know if he'll live through this. I don't know nothing. I'm scared. How am I going to tell his mama if he died? What, what am I going to tell those kids? And what, What's the purpose? This don't make sense. The boy's been through all kinds of hell on earth. It don't make sense. And now you're going to take him from us? I guess about 45 minutes I was praying and crying. My face, in a sense, up against the wall. Finally, the phone rings. It's Cherie again. And, and, and she said, uh, Papa, I've seen him. He'll be okay. He's got some broken ribs and, and things like that, but he's going to be okay, Papa. He's going to be okay. And I said, thank God. Thank God. Thank God. He heard my prayer. Now, listen, what is it that you need God to hear your prayer? What is your prayer? What is it he, you need His attention for? You see, you don't really know. And by the way, nothing, this is a great statement. You ready? Nothing is real until it's personal. I can talk all day long about your problem, your problem, your problem, your problem, your problem, your problem. But until it becomes my problem, it's not really real. Does that make sense? When it becomes your problem, it's real. So when those real problems come, what's the ingredients in that prayer while you're facing that wall? Well, first of all, let me just say this. You've got to come to a moment of complete, complete helplessness. Complete helplessness. You know why God sometimes puts us in those situations? So that we have no one to lean on but Him. Only trust Him, only trust Him, only trust Him now. He will save you, He will save you. Listen, there comes moments when He wants to be the one to save you. He wants to be your deliverer and no one else. He doesn't want to share that with we. And listen, we'll never seek God like He wants us to seek Him until we're completely helpless. You know what makes us not completely helpless? Pride. Boy, if I got something to... If, it's, if there's a pet peeve, it's mine. Pride. I despise it. People who will swell up against God and say, you know what? I'm working this out on my own. I can make this on my own. I'll do this by myself. I don't need you. I don't need you. I don't need you. And I don't need you. I'm going to do this. Pride. Pride. I wonder how many times that I've read in the Psalms where, where David cried out to God and said things like, Help me, O God. Arise for my help. Make haste to help me. 
David knew what it was to be completely helpless before the Lord. One time in Psalm uh, chapter 142, I think it is, he was in a cave called Adullam. Psalm 142, I think. And inside that cave, he was all by himself. He was being hunted like a dog and, and he, was in, he was hiding out and, and he felt like God was nowhere to be found and he wrote the words in that psalm. He wrote these words, No man cares for my soul. Have you ever felt that way when you felt like nobody really cared? They could care less if you died or you lived. They couldn't care less. But God cares. Amen. God, God cares. God wants to help you. There's got to be complete helplessness. There's got to be complete humility. Humility. That thing of pride. James 4, 6 says, God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Psalm 10, 17, David said, Lord, thou hast heard the desire of the humble. 2 Chronicles 7, 14, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves. You know why we don't see America, see a revival in America? Uh, pride. We are not following the instructions of 2 Chronicles 7, 14. We're just not. And we don't want to because we'd have to turn from our wicked ways. And we'd have to humble ourselves and seek His face. Uh, we're just too proud for that. Too, just, too, just too proud. But I'm telling you that night when I knelt beside my bed and praying for my son and maybe others of you in this room have felt the same way, I, I, I would have easily said and probably did, God, spare him, take me. If you got to take somebody, take me. Don't take him. Right? That's humility. More of God, less of me. That's humility. There's got to be a complete humility. There's got to be a complete brokenness. Look with me, if you would, to Psalm in chapter 34. I've got to go quickly. Psalm 34. Look with me at verse 18. Psalm 34, verse 18. Wonderful verse for us to know. And it says this. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. A humble heart. A humble heart. And that's what God is looking. A broken heart. A complete brokenness. You remember me telling you the story about the potter and the clay and how the potter came to a point with that clay that he could no longer go forward? This pot was never going to make it like it was. There had to be a change. And so he would stop the wheel and he would take out the hard place in the potter, pottery and then he would break it back down till it was just a big pile of clay again. I felt that way. One time I remember... I'll never forget it. I was pastor of a good church. Things were going well, and I thought in my mind that I ought to be an evangelist. And I, and I said, what's what I'm going to do? I resigned my church. I moved my family to South Haven, Mississippi, joined a big-name church there, and I was going to be an evangelist, and I was going to change the world. I was going to do it. But what I didn't know is that I had crossed a line with God I stepped over a line with God. Instead of listening to God, I got ahead of God. Got out, got out there without God's blessing. And God had to chasten me for a little while. He had to break me. By the time I got through with that experience, I was pretty much broken. God has to do that sometimes to you. I don't like it. I don't like it at all. But it's for our betterment. And then last but not least, there has to be a complete surrender. A complete surrender. Oh, I wish I could get you to see this this morning. This is the secret word that nobody knows. And nobody likes to say. You very rarely hear it in conversation. And you don't like hearing it from the pulpit. And you just don't like saying it and looking at it and thinking about it. But here's that secret word. You ready? This is the secret word to the Christian life. It's the word surrender. Surrender. All to Jesus, I surrender all to Him. 
I completely give. Uh, I surrender all. I surrender all. What a great invitation song that is, but that's the answer. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. That's surrender. You know how you got saved? You surrendered. You know how you got called to preach and became a preacher if you're a preacher? You, 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 you surrendered. You know how you exercise your spiritual gifts in the church? By surrendering to do that. There are folks who can sing that aren't singing. There are folks who can teach but aren't teaching. There are folks who can help but aren't helping. Until you surrender. And Hezekiah had to get to that moment when he was completely surrendered. We're all reminded of Jesus in the garden. As he's sweating great drops of blood, he made this amazing statement, Not my will, but thine be done. That's what God wants out of us. Where is it? Where are you? What is that wall that you're backed up against right now? Physically? Spiritually? Mentally? Financially? Health-wise? Can I tell you something? I believe with all my heart that prayer, prayer still works. Amen. You have not? Why? Because you ask not. There are folks in this room this morning, in just a moment we're going to give an invitation. You need to be at these altars. You need to be praying right now and saying, God, I surrender all. I give this problem to you. I don't know what's going to happen, but I can't deal with it. I've got to let you deal with it. You told me it may kill me, but Lord, I know you can change that. I know you can help me overcome that. I know you can break down that wall. And instead of it being a grave marker, it can be a place where I can relish in a victory through Jesus Christ, my Lord. You come, you ask God to help you with that wall this morning. But God will, He will. Father, I, I pray this morning that you'd help us. Oh, don't let pride stand in our way when we know we got a wall that we're facing and we got to deal with that somehow and we don't know how to do it. We got to let you do it. God, change it. Change it. And I pray for God's people this morning.